Okay, so in the last chapter, the very last thing we discussed was um, basically how the electrons are arranged in an atom. We defined a couple of terms, shells, orbitals, and so on. And basically, we're going to extend from that, all right? Now, what we're going to do is start talking about exactly how the electrons are arranged in an atom. And we're going to start off with the simplest atom, which is hydrogen atom. And we're going to talk about how the electrons are arranged in terms of their energies. Now, I want to show you this diagram right here. This diagram is called um, an orbital energy diagram. To the left, we have the diagram here for a hydrogen atom. And to the right, we have one for a typical multi-electron atom, which basically means all other atoms apart from hydrogen. Okay, now, in the case of the hydrogen atom, we will have the shells, right? And remember, the shells have the n equal 1, n equal 2, and n equal 3 um, designations based on their energy. n equal 1 will represent the shell, which is closest to the nucleus. And then you have n equal 2, n equal 3, and so on, that are further away from the nucleus. So what this shows you basically is how the subshells are arranged within each shell. So the first shell is the n equal 1 shell. And here we see we have the s orbital here, which is the only orbital that is present in the first shell. I'm sorry about that. And then the second shell will have one s orbital and two, three 2p orbitals. And then the third shell will have your 3s, 3p, 3d. And then that will continue onwards. That pattern continues onwards in the higher shells, right? You'll notice that where you have shells with different subshells the subshells have the same energy so the energy of the 2s subshell will be the same of that of 2p and the 3s 3p and 3d subshells all have the same energy and it's the same is true for all the other subshells within their respective shells so that is the case when it comes to the hydrogen atom however when it comes to a multi-electron atom what you'll find that there are two differences when you compare the two when you compare the hydrogen atom to the typical multi-electron atom the first difference you'll notice is that all the shells have their energies closer to the um, to the nucleus, or another way of looking at it, their energies would be significantly lower compared to the hydrogen atom. So you'll notice that the first shell is here in terms of energy in the case of the hydrogen atom, but here that same shell in a multi-electron atom would be lower. The same is true for all the other shells. So for the second shell, which is here, in the case of the multi-electron atom, it is further down in terms of energy. So that's one big difference between the way the shells are arranged in the hydrogen atom compared to the multi-electron atom. Another difference is that where you have different subshells present within the same shell, their energies would be different as well. So for example, if you look at the second shell in the case of the hydrogen atom, the 2S subshell is equal to the 2P subshell in terms of energy as we said before but that is not the case when it comes to the multi-electron atom what you'll find is that the 2s sublevel will be lower in energy compared to the 2p sublevel and you'll see a similar pattern when it comes to the third shell and the fourth shell in the case of the third shell the 3s sublevel is lower in energy compared to the 2p sublevel which in turn is lower in energy compared to the 3d sublevel and so on and so forth so those are just two differences um, between the multi-electron atom and the hydrogen atom. Okay, so this kind of makes things complicated in terms of how we arrange the electrons and how we arrange the actual orbitals in terms of their energy. So we're going to learn how to do that. Um, and in fact, the term here, electron configuration, is a term that we use to basically describe how the electrons are distributed among the various orbitals. And there are two ways of rep representing an electron configuration. You can use what is known as the SPDF notation, and an example is shown here, right? So in this representation of the electron configuration, um, you may see something like this, where this number here represents the shell or the energy level of the particular um, electron. This here, the S, represents the subshell of the particular electrons. And the two here, which is written as a superscript, is basically representing the number of electrons within this sublevel. All right. So this is one way of representing how the electrons are distributed in an atom in terms of the energy. 
Um, another way is by using what we call an orbital or box diagram, where we use boxes to represent orbitals or the sublevels. Well, actually, the boxes themselves represent orbitals. So this box represents um, an orbital belonging to the 1s sublevel. This orbital represents, um, this is an orbital representing, um, or this is a box representing an orbital residing in the 2s sublevel. And these three orbitals here, um, these boxes represent three orbitals residing in the 2p sublevel. All right. Um, in addition to boxes, we use arrows to represent electrons. And if you remember, we talked about the fact that there are two quantum numbers um, for the spins of electrons. Well, the direction of the arrows basically represent the spin. All right. So um, the typical convention that is used um, in terms of the quantum numbers assignment, the electrons or the arrows pointing up represent the electrons that are spinning with a spin quantum number of plus half. And the electrons pointing down represents the electrons, which um, has a spin quantum number of minus one, all right? Um, we're gonna talk about how that plays an important part in terms of how the electrons are distributed among the orbitals as well. Okay, so here are the rules for determining the electron configurations of atoms. Now, let me state here that these rules are for the ground state configurations, all right? So these rules don't necessarily apply to excited state configurations. And I'll make a distinction between the two when it comes to these rules as I go along. Okay, so the first rule is that electrons ordinarily occupy orbitals of the lowest energy available, all right? So in the ground state configuration, the electrons will try to um, find themselves in the lowest possible energy orbitals that's available. In doing so, we have to take into account this particular rule or principle known as Pauli's exclusion principle. And this principle says that one atomic orbital can accommodate no more than two electrons. And these two electrons that are occupying that one orbital must be having opposing spins, all right? So going back to, let me go back to the previous um, diagram here. So you'll notice that you have two electrons here in the 1s orbital, two electrons here in the 2s orbitals. And you'll notice that they're spinning in opposite directions, right? You cannot, according to Pauli's exclusion principle, you simply cannot have under any conditions, a situation where both electrons occupying the same orbital will be spinning in the same direction. Okay, so going back to the rules. Um, oh, I should add here that another way of stating Pauli's exclusion principle is that no two electrons in the same atom may have all four quantum numbers alike. All right, so that's just another way of stating it. Um, you can try this on your own, but if you look at each electron present in any atom and you look at their quantum numbers, the four quantum numbers, um, what you'll find is that no two electrons in the same atom will have those four identical quantum numbers, all right? Okay, um, another rule when it comes to assigning electrons in the ground state configuration, of a group of orbitals of identical energy, electrons enter the orbitals that are empty whenever possible, all right? So basically what this is suggesting is that if you have a situation like, and let me get out of um, this here, and let me go to my writing pad here. Okay, so basically what they're saying here is that let's say you want to determine the electron configuration of, um, I'm gonna use nitrogen again as an example, right? So nitrogen has seven electrons. So the first orbital, I'm gonna use the boxes to represent the orbitals. So this is the 1s orbital. The first electron will go here. The second electron will pair up. And then in the 2s orbital, the first electron will go here and the second electron will go here. And then when you get to the three 2p orbitals, so these are your 2p orbitals, the question now becomes where will the fifth electron go? Um, well, the answer is that the fifth electron can go into any one of these three vacant um, p orbital, right? So we can put one here. So the question now becomes, where will the sixth electron go? And the answer is it can go into any one of these two. So going back to, um, going back to Hans rule, it says the electrons will enter empty orbitals whenever possible when you have a group of orbitals of identical energy. So what that means therefore is that the next orbital 
rather than pairing up with this electron right here, will simply go into another available vacant um, p orbital. And then the seventh electron will neither go here or here, but will go into this p orbital here. So basically, when you're assigning electrons to orbitals of equal energy, you try to spread them out, right? Assign them singly into each orbital. And then pairing will take place, right? So in the case of oxygen, which is the next element, which has um, eight electrons, it will be the same as this, excepting that another electron will go here, right? So this would be the electron configuration of oxygen. Okay, I just thought I should show you that example to demonstrate Hun's rule. Okay, um, next rule, electrons in half-filled orbitals have parallel spins. Very important. And let me go back to the example I was just working with, because you'll notice, let me get my eraser here to get back to the electronic configuration of nitrogen. You'll notice that in the case of nitrogen, the way the electrons are distributed here, apart from the fact that they are each singly occupying an orbital, you'll notice that they are basically um, spinning in the same direction. All right, so that's how you arrange the electrons in the ground state. Um, basically, when you're distributing those electrons among orbitals of equal energy, the first set of electrons to occupy the orbital singly must be spinning in the same direction in order for you to achieve a ground state configuration. Okay, um, so those are the rules. Now, another thing that you need to know is basically how the orbitals are arranged in energy. And it becomes very difficult to predict when you get up to the fourth, between the fourth and third shell. So this diagram here is useful for helping you to remember how the orbitals are distributed, all right? So basically, the way I, as a student back in the day, um, memorized this, or this diagram is that I write down um, all the s orbitals down like this, 1s, 2s, all the way down to 7s, and then I start here at the second energy level, or shell, with the p orbitals, 2p, 3p, all the way down to 7p, and then I get to the 3d energy level, or the third shell, and start with 3d, 4d, all the way down to 6d, and then here I simply have 4f, 5f, and then I draw the arrows, all right? And basically, the order of the orbitals, in terms of their energies, can be obtained by following the arrows from top to bottom, from um, tail to head. So the order would be 1s, then 2s, then 2p, 3s, then 3p, 4s, then 3d, 4p, 5s, and so on and so forth, all right? So it will be worthwhile for you to remember this diagram so that you'll be able to write down the electronic configuration of pretty much any atom if you follow the rules as we talked about earlier, all right? Um, the off-bar principle is basically um, the hypothetical process of building up an atom based on the atomic number and assigning the electrons to the respective um, orbitals. So if we follow this process, um, basically it's very simple. Let's start with hydrogen. So hydrogen, of course, is the simplest element, has only one electron, so therefore the electronic configuration of the ground state hydrogen atom is 1s, 1, and then the next element would be helium, and of course, since there's an s orbital that can have a maximum of two electrons, then the next electron will simply go into that same orbital, spinning in the opposite direction, and therefore the helium will have a 1s2 electron configuration. The next element is lithium. Now, as far as the first sublevel is concerned, it is completely full, right? So therefore, if you're adding an electron to that to get the lithium configuration, that electron has no other place to go but the 2s sublevel. It cannot go into the 1s sublevel because the 1s sublevel is um, is full already. So therefore, this would be the resulting electron configuration. Then the next element, um, let me just do that here. Um, let me get my pen function here. Okay, so the next element, just to show you the continuing trend, where the atomic number is four, um, that would be beryllium, and its electronic configuration would be 1s2, 2s2, all right? And so on and so forth for the other atoms, right? All you have to just do is go from one to the other, adding electrons according to the number of, um, the atomic number that you start off with, 
making sure, of course, that the orbitals are in the correct order, again, according to or as predicted by the diagram here. All right. So that's a reason why it's important for you to, excuse me, memorize this diagram. OK, so let me go back to this slide and let me talk about the noble gas abbreviation, which is another way of writing down the electronic configuration, especially useful when it comes to the very large atoms. Because as you can imagine, if you were to use this normal way, let me go back to my pointer. If you were to use the normal way of, um, or the unabbreviated version of writing down the electron configuration for larger atoms like silver and radon and so on, as you can imagine, it can be a very long string. And sometimes you don't really need that much information. So to abbreviate it, um, the way that we do it in chemistry is that we identify the group eight element that comes immediately before the element that you're trying to determine the configuration of. Configuration of. So for example, let's say we want to write down the abbreviated version for lithium, the abbreviated configuration for lithium. Well, if you look at the periodic table, you see that the element in group eight that comes before lithium is helium. So helium, you'll notice, has, um, I'm sorry, helium, you'll notice, has the electron configuration of 1s2, right? So in the electronic configuration of lithium, we replace the 1s2 part of it with the symbol for helium within square parentheses. And then you write down what's left, which would be 2s1, all right? So that's basically how we obtain the electronic configuration of an atom in the abbreviated way and not the, um, the non-abbreviated way. So just to show you how useful that way of expressing the electronic configuration is, you'll notice here that this is the electronic configuration of titanium. And you'll notice that you have the electron configuration of argon um, represented by this symbol right here. Now, if I were to write down the full configuration of titanium, let me do that here, you're gonna see the difference in terms of the length of characters needed because the argon part of it would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. So this here would be the argon part of it and then the rest would be 4s2 um, and then 3d2. So basically, this is the unabbreviated version that I just wrote down, and the abbreviated version can be obtained by simply replacing this part here that I'm putting in the box right here with the symbol that is shown here, right? Because this part here is the electronic config, this part here is the electronic configuration of argon, all right? So um, that's basically how we deal with especially um, larger atoms. If we don't need all of the electronic configuration, we can simply abbreviate it as shown here in the case of titanium. Okay, so here is an example. This question asks um, for us to write down the electronic configuration for sulfur using both the SP SPDF notation and the orbital diagram. So, um, Okay, I'm having a hard time. Okay, so um, first thing we'd have to do is look for the electronic, the atomic number of sulfur, which is 16. So sulfur, oops, sulfur would have an atomic number of 16, right? So if you're writing down the electronic configuration using the SPDF notation, it would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, um, 3s2, so that would make it so far um, 14, which means that the next sublevel 3p will have two electrons. So that would be the electronic configuration, the full electronic configuration of sulfur um, using the SPDF notation. Now, if I were to use the box diagram or the orbital diagram, it's going to look like this. This is 1s, which has two electrons, one spinning up, the other one spinning down, and then you have the 2s, one spinning up, one spinning down, that's a 2s, and then the 2p sublevel will have three 2p orbitals, 
So two P. So basically one, two, three, four, five, six. And then you have the three S. There's only one three S orbital. Three S. And then as far as the three P orbitals are concerned, there are three of them. And if you remember, we said that when you come up on a situation like this, you have to make sure that the electrons are assigned singly. Whoops, that's one. And the electrons must be spinning in opposite directions. So basically, that would be the electron configuration of sulfur using the box diagram um, representation. Okay, so that's how you do that example. All right, now based on the electron arrangements of um, the atoms, you'll find that there's a correlation between the electron configuration and where these atoms or the regions um, that these atoms are located in the periodic table. And as a result of that, we have some broad categories here. Um, you have what are known as the main group elements. The main group elements are those elements where as you go from one atom to the next across a period, you're adding an electron to an S or P orbital of the valence shell. So the main group elements are colored blue here in this region, groups 1A, 2A, then 3A, all the way to 8A. So basically the A group elements, those are called the main group elements. And then we have a transition element region where basically you're adding electrons to a subshell that is in the inner region or the inner principal shell. Um, so it's not a valence shell addition. Um, so basically, um, if you look at, for example, elements in group, or I should say period four, as you go from one element to the next, you're actually adding an electron to the third um, shell, all right, and not the fourth shell. And then you have the main group in a transition region, um, which is shown in um, colored here in, uh, this looks like cream or yellow. Um, and in that case, you're adding an electron to a shell, which is um, one shell removed from the valence shell, all right? So this basically summarizes what we're talking about here. In the case of the main group elements, you're adding an electron to the S orbital or the P orbital of the valence shell. Um, in the case of the inner transition, or I should say the transition elements, you're adding an electron to the D subshell which is below the energy of the, of the S um, subshell in the fourth shell. That is true in this region right here. So basically what we're saying is that you're adding an electron to a D subshell level. And then here, as far as the inner transition elements are concerned, as you go from one element to the next, you're adding an electron to the F sub level. All right, so that's basically a summary of the different regions in the periodic table based on the general electron configurations of the atoms of the elements. Okay, um, so let's look at this example right here. It says, give the complete ground state electron configuration of a strontium atom in both the SPDF notation and in the noble gas core abbreviated notation. Okay, so in order for us to do that, I'm go to my pad right here, or I should, actually go to this right here. Let me go to this PowerPoint slide and let me do the full screen thing and let me get my pen out. Okay, so strontium is the element and according to my periodic table, the atomic number of strontium is 38. So this is a relatively large atom. So, um, okay, so strontium atomic number is 38, all right? So, Using the table above as a guide, um, using the SPDF notation, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and then the next would be 3d10. So, so far we have 30 electrons being added. We have eight more electrons to go. The next orbital in line would be 4p, and the maximum capacity for that sublevel is six, which means that we have two more electrons 
and therefore those two electrons will go into the 5s sublevel, 5s2. So this would be the full electron configuration of um, strontium, all right? Now, the question now is, for the abbreviated version, which element in group 8 comes immediately before strontium in the periodic table? And as I consult my periodic table here, I see that that element is krypton. And the atomic number of krypton is 36, right? So basically, this part of the electronic configuration of strontium here is the same as the electronic configuration of krypton. So therefore, the abbreviated version of this full electron configuration will be krypton symbol in square parentheses followed by 5s2. And that's how we get the abbreviated version, all right? Okay, so this, and let me get back to the PowerPoint slide. Okay, so um, the off-bar principle works well for most atoms, but there are some exceptions, and two of them are noted here, right? Now, what I'm going to do is follow the trend for the first row of transition elements, right, which is period four. So um, before scandium, you would have um, potassium and then calcium, right? Um, potassium will have the electronic configuration of AR. Let me write this down. Let me go to my pen mode first. So I'm going to put it up here somewhere. So for potassium, its electronic configuration, abbreviated, would be AR. 4s1, and for um, calcium, it's going to be AR4s2, all right? So the next electron, or the next element, will be um, scandium. And scandium, you'd have to add one electron to the 3d sublevel, because the 4s sublevel is already full, all right? And then the next electron, going from scandium to titanium, let me go to my pointer here. Okay, so to go from scandium to titanium, you add another electron here to get titanium, right? And then to go from titanium to vanadium, you add an electron here to get this electronic configuration. Now, one would think that to get from vanadium to chromium, you simply add an electron here and you get the resulting electron configuration. But it turns out, and there's a long story behind it, but basically it turns out that that electronic configuration is not the most stable. In fact, the most stable configuration is the one that's shown here, where you have all the orbitals here of the 3D sublevel completely half-filled, and this is half-filled as well. So it turns out that this electronic configuration, which is half-filled um, for all the sublevels, um, for the 3D and 4S um, sublevels, turns out to be more stable than the 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 three um the 4s2 3d4 um sublevel that one would think would be the result all right so that's one exception to the Ackbar principle and then we get to so that's in the case of chromium i should note that's what happens in the case of chromium and then when it comes to copper you see a similar thing whereas going from nickel to copper you would think that you would add an electron here to get this it turns out that this is not the resulting electron configuration is not as stable as this that you see here, where the 3D sublevel is completely filled and the 4S sublevel is half filled, right? So that's another exception when it comes to the um, off-bar principle, all right? And you'll find that for rows that are below um, period four, um, you'll find a similar pattern for the corresponding elements within the same groups as chromium and copper. Um, in fact, as you get down to the heavier at atoms, it becomes a bit more um, less predictable. Um, and the main reason for that is because you have the energy levels being close to each other for the different shells, or I should say for the subshells from different shells, all right? So that's something that you need to be aware of, especially when it comes to period four, that the electronic configuration of chromium and copper is not what you'd expect, but this situation here, where the subshell is either completely filled for the 3D sublevel or half filled, um, well, 
completely filled in the case of copper and half filled in the case of chromium. All right. So that's something you need to be aware of. Okay. Um, so that's basically it for this particular video. Um, the next video will deal with the difference between valence electrons and core electrons and how we will determine the electron configuration of ions. All right. So until next time.